Have you ever heard of Joshua, the small town laborer who was an observer of the Mosaic law and who often attended synagogue? If you haven't, you might know him better through the Greek transliteration of his Hebrew name, Yeshua, or as it's written and pronounced in English, Jesus. 2,000 years after the mortal life of Jesus and the expansive global spread of Christianity, it can become easy to overlook the fundamental nature of Judaism in Christianity and that Jesus himself was Jewish. As Rabbi Leo Baek said, Jesus could have developed as he came to be only on the soil of Judaism. Here is BYU Ancient Scripture professor Avram Shannon, who has degrees in Jewish studies and Near Eastern languages, speaking to this similar point. From the New Testament perspective, Jesus was Jewish, he grew up Jewish, he lives Jewish, he lives law, he talks about law, he he just he just he does things in a Jewish way. And to understand who he is, we've got to understand that first. In this episode, Professor Shannon helps us understand how Jewish rabbinic literature, which are the texts written by Jewish sages, can help better enlighten us about certain aspects of the New Testament, Jesus' mortal ministry, and Christianity. I'm your host, Professor Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp interviewed his colleague, Professor Avram Shannon, on his publication of Rabbinic Literature in the New Testament. Following our typical three-part episode, in part one, Dr. Shannon discusses why he published this research, making connections between rabbinic literature and the New Testament through a few poignant examples, including our assumptions about the trial of Jesus and some clearer insight into the idea of an apostle. In part two, he gets more into application and why understanding rabbinic literature can be helpful for the everyday saint. And in part three, he tells us some personal whys, including why he chose to be a religious educator and why he chooses faith. Here's Ryan Sharp with his colleague, Professor Avram Shannon. All right, we're here to talk about your chapter in the volume which was edited by Lincoln Blumel, and the the volume was called The New Testament History, Culture, and Society, A Background to the Text of the New Testament. So your chapter in that volume was entitled Rabbinic Literature and the New Testament. So I actually want to start there. Uh, What I would love to know is what interested you in rabbinic rabbinic literature? How did you get uh, involved in that work? So I got my... I used to joke, my name's Avram. Avram, of course, is a Hebrew name. Uh, my mother was Jewish before she joined the church. And um, I used to joke that she'd name me something like Fred or something, um, <laughs> that I'd done like Chinese studies or whatever. But after naming me Avram, I mean, Hebrew studies was, I mean, just sort of a uh, a given, I guess, in some ways. Um, I originally was, well, I got my start as an undergraduate and even in my early graduate program doing Hebrew Bible, doing um, Old Testament, doing Bible studies and, and sort of those kinds of things, working the Psalms and uh, um, things like that. It was in my PhD program that I kind of began to sort of make the shift. And part of it just initially was was courses offered, right? It was a new PhD program at Ohio State where I did my PhD. And they didn't have a lot of pure Bible classes. So I was doing interpretation history. I was doing um, – I had a course in liturgy. That was very, very interesting on Jewish liturgy. Uh, And so as I began to work through thinking about, you know, moving towards getting my dissertation topic and things like that, I came to the realization, one, that I'd had as much, as many classes on later Judaism than I'd had on Bible stuff Mm -hmm. um, proper. And so 
And again, I'd always been interested in, again, my, my, my master's program was on, it was technically a biblical Hebrew thing, but it was in Jewish studies. So I'd already had, a, you know, a background in Jewish studies um, as such. And so it was kind of just sort of this gradual shift mm-hmm. into it. It wasn't like I grew up, up one we're going to do rabbinic literature. And then as we we're thinking about topics, um, the, the uh, Mishnah, it's the, um, the earliest codification of Jewish law, was sort of a natural progression in terms of both the philological and the linguistic stuff, as well as the questions I was interested in talking about in terms of culture and religion. So against that backdrop, let's, let's dive in. I, I want to share something that you wrote and then give you a chance to elaborate on it. So in, in uh, the introduction you write, so though it probably goes without saying, it is important to remember that Jesus and his earliest followers were Jews who lived a decidedly Jewish context and that Jesus's mortal ministry was specifically to the house of Israel. It is only after the resurrection that the gospel message was taken in earnest to non-Jews. In fact, many of the ideas in Christianity that seem universal, such as the existence of a Messiah, are Jewish notion, notions that the earliest Christians brought to their non-Jewish converts. The original 12 apostles were all Jews, as were Paul and Barnabas and the vast majority of the earliest Christian leaders. So why do you feel like that is such an important starting point for this discussion? Um, I think part of it is because of because of 2,000 years of Christian history and because of sort of 2,000 years of, again, we'll get a, I get a little bit more about this, but the sometimes fraught relationship between um, Judaism and Christianity, we haven't always in Christianity generally, and even the church specifically, thought about the fundamentally Jewish nature of Christianity. The fact that without Judaism, there really is no Christianity as such. I mean, I guess Latter-day Saints, you know, we know that the gospel message is as old as Father Adam and Mother Eve. But in terms of the way it comes forward to us, especially through the New Testament, it's fundamentally um, bound in and built from um, Jewish ideas, Jewish notions, Jewish practices. It it will, especially as you get later into the um, Christian period, um, develop itself against that. Um, there's a great book by a man by the name of David Nirenberg who talks about Judaism as this thought category of others for Christianity and things like that. And, but really it's because to really understand what's going on, to understand who Jesus was in mortality, right? This is not talking about Jesus in his, you know, cosmic, um, trans historical, um, that, you know, the book of Mormon, Jesus, Judaism will not help very much because again, the, you know, the, the eternal God, right? That's kind of the Book of Mormon perspective. But from the New Testament perspective, Jesus was Jewish. He grew up Jewish. He lives Jewish. He lives law. He talks about law. He he just, he just, he does things in a Jewish way. And to understand who he is, we've got to understand that first. Okay, that is really helpful. I want to read one more little excerpt here and then give you a chance to elaborate, and and then we'll dive into really the meat of your chapter here. So you write, this means that Judaism is the essential matrix that Christianity and the New Testament grow out of. Because of this, understanding Judaism can help us better comprehend the background and the activities in the New Testament. It's represented, uh, it represented a complex series of interrelated ethnic religious ritual, and political ideals that were expressed in various ways. These expressions were so varied that some scholars of ancient Judaism have preferred to talk about Judaisms rather than Judaism. So against that backdrop, help us understand uh, what you mean when you refer to rabbinic Judaism. When we're talking about rabbinic Judaism, we're talking about a Judaism that is fundamentally coming from texts that we have. It's coming from um, Mishnah, it's coming from Gemara and Talmud. We'll talk about those. Um, these are these are legal collections from um, these ancient Jewish authors. They called themselves the sages. And so, there's so, we can make connections between sort of archaeological, the synagogue, um, and things like that. But sometimes those connections are are harder to make. Um, and so, really, rabbinic Judaism is that Judaism that is expressed in the text written by the rabbinic sages, running from about 8200 to roughly about 8700. We can talk, you know, the later forms of Judaism that are based on these texts can be rabbinic in that sense, but the rabbis themselves is usually the Mishnaic and the Talmudic periods, so about 200 to about 700. Okay, very good. Uh, 
in there you also talk about a biblical um, interpretation known as midrash. Um, maybe just spend a few minutes helping our listeners understand this approach. Okay, so midrash is the famous um, scholar of biblical studies, et cetera, Jewish scholar, um, James Kugel, um, has written extensively on midrash, and he said at one point, he said, due to all the other studies that have so far failed to... Um, uh, define midrash. I cannot help but to fail to define midrash at this point as well. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a slippery um, thing, but I mean, really, the word comes from Hebrew um, drash, that means to search out, to look for, to to, to seek for. Um, and so the the idea behind the literature is it's I mean it's biblical interpretation. It's it's Jewish biblical interpretation, and so it's designed to pull out um, out of the text um, and. A lot of it, especially in the earliest phases, is concerned with understanding biblical law, understanding Jewish law, understanding what Jews call halakha. Halakha is is the word for—I mean, it comes from a word that means walk. It's kind of like godly walk. It's how you live the commandments. And and so there's a whole category of Jewish biblical tradition, Jewish midrash, that's concerned with that. Um, there's a lot of narrative expansion that um, goes on in terms of, of midrash. That's called agadic, agada meaning tellings, um, agadic uh, midrashim. And what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll look at the text. And the idea is not that they're inventing new things. The idea behind midrash is that the the text of the scriptures is um, full of meaning. And so what the Midrashist does, Darshan in Hebrew, um, is he he goes through and he looks for places where their can, meaning can be found. And there are lots of ways to do. Um, one thing that they'll do is think like the omnisignificance of the text, that it has meaning all across um, all of it. And th- th- there's a saying that says there's no early or late in um, Torah. Um, one of the, the sages says this, which means that they're not bound by temporal things. Hmm. So for example, in one of the Midrashim on Genesis, um, Eve quotes um, later prophets, hmm. you know, to make her point against the serpent. Um, the idea being that all of scripture is is open and it can interpret itself. Um, they're very attuned to things like repetition of words. Um, if, if, if it says the same thing, in some ways, uh, again, James Kuhl talks about this, he talks about the rabbinic forgetting of parallelism. So, you know, the, the, the primary way that Hebrew poetry expresses itself is in parallel statements. A, what's more B, right? The word of the Lord, the sayings of God. That's a very, 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 very common thing like the Psalms, mm. like Isaiah. Um, what the sages do is they say, well, this is redundant information. Therefore, this must be teaching us something. So the word of the Lord must mean something and the sayings of God must mean something else. And so they'll use those kinds of repetitions to um, do that. A famous example is um, in the Joseph story. Um, they sell, um, you know, Joseph to Potiphar. And the Hebrew says, you know, the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible says, you know, to Potiphar, an Egyptian. And the rabbis say, well, we already know he was an Egyptian. They, they said that previously. So why are they saying that here? And because that information that's already been there, they will then use that to extrapolate into the text and that it, it means something the way it is. So what you do then is you make these connections between uh, rabbinic literature and the New Testament, and really you provide three examples. So let's dive into each of these, and let's begin with the trial of Jesus, where uh, you you suggested that uh, rabbinic literature has been appealed to as a tool against Judaism. Tell us more about that, and specifically, let's look at the trial of Jesus. Sure. So it's this idea that we find this a lot in various parts, including... um, Again, especially as you get into as as the the again, I, I talked previously about the, the the often fraught relationship between um, Judaism and Christianity, and so within the trial of Jesus, there was this whole tendency to use rabbinic texts to prove, you know, the perfidy of the Jews, right? To, you know, and it's 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 uh, it's beating them with their own book in uh, in some ways, and it's it's I mean it's it's a very 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 common. Um, anti-Semitic trope. Um, you actually see it, people use it against us, Latter-day Saints, where there's a whole class of anti-Mormon literature that just, you know, looks through our stuff and finds stuff that people don't like, you know, and, and uses that uh, as a way of attacking us. And so that's kind of what has happened in the trial of Jesus, especially this notion, it's, it's 
it's fairly common in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to talk about the trial of Jesus as illegal. Um, it's partially very common for that because um, when Brother Talmadge wrote Jesus the Christ, he drew on some of the scholarship that um, that suggested the trial was um, illegal. Now, none of this is to diminish um, Elder Talmadge. He did great work. Um, but in terms of the trial of Jesus, Jesus the Christ suffers from being um, based on, on this scholarship. And so the, my purpose in that section was really to kind of work through and show that, one, really, so when we talk about the evidence for the trial of Jesus, part of it relates to the usefulness and the appropriateness of using rabbinic material in to understand the New Testament. Remembering that our earliest New Testament sources, sorry, not our New Testament, our earliest rabbinic sources, um, the, the Mishnah, so the earliest rabbinic um, codification of Jewish law, dates to AD 200, okay? So it dates... Um, what that means then is that it is a literature that is removed temporarily from um, the New Testament. Again, the dating of the various books of the New Testament is a specialist question, sort of outside of my um, value. But mostly, the New Testament's already in place long before um, AD 200. And so, and so the problem is, is you then look at this text that's much later, and you say, oh, well, this shows that they're doing this, that they did this thing that's wrong. They held it at night. You can't hold it at night. So they'll use the rabbinic rules of jurisprudence as laid out mostly in the Mishnaic tractate. That you, aren't in place at that time. That are, that, that, we don't know yeah, right. whether they're in place at that time. That's the real problem is, is the evidentiary divide is, is, is a real problem. That because – this is why it was so important to define rabbinics and rabbinic Judaism as a, as a Judaism based around this text – the evidence we have is the text. We have archaeological stuff. We can work through other things. We can kind of see other people in other texts. But when you're working from the text, the evidence we have is what's there in Mishnah. And what's there in Mishnah claims often to be um, reflecting an earlier time. But we can't tell. And even, you know, even within some of our ancient texts, you know, um, I believe it's the Gospel of John makes a big deal that, you know, the Jews didn't have right to um, for capital punishment. That's why, you know, so that the Romans had to um, had to kill Jesus. But, of course, in Acts, you know, um, they stone Stephen. And there doesn't seem any sense that there's, you know. And so so this idea that there's no right to capital punishment, all these things that say, oh, this is this or that. Other, even within a corpus of technically New Testament, those things are inconsistent, let alone then bring in another text that's totally different. And then there's the huge difficulty with using – that text to attack itself, that this shows how terrible the Jews are because they don't even keep their own law. Hmm. Now, I mean, actually, I think the best argument against the illegality of the trial of Jesus actually comes from um, uh, Tom Wayment, um, where he says, basically, the New Testament authors don't claim it's illegal. And so, <laughs> and they had real reason to make claims. So if they're not claiming it's illegal and they're bringing evidence for it, then we probably shouldn't either. And that's the real problem is, is that it uses Judaism as – or uses Judaism's own text as a weapon against Judaism. Yeah. And, and that's for things that are not even necessary by the New Testament. Yeah. So why, why do you think this is significant? Why, why take the time to unpack it? One, because in my experience, Latter-day Saints are not anti-Semitic. I mean, this is just, you know, we're, you know, we, we have, in fact, we often claim um, notions of philo-Semitism. You know, we love, um, you know, our, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters. But because of a lot of reasons, including the way discourse works in um, American culture and things like that, we have inherited um, oftentimes almost an accidental anti-Semitism. We will use accident, we use anti-Semitic tropes accidentally without even being aware that they are um, anti-Semitic, hmm. not being aware that we are we're, that we are attacking Jews um, with that, without, and, without even meaning to, without even meaning to. No, we're we're yeah. just repeating, you know, and and unfortunately, what you find then when 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 Brother Talmadge repeated some of these things again, most of it's based on this book by a guy named William Chandler. Um, when Brother Talmadge repeated. Um, these things, it kind of worked its way into our discourse because so many of us, including me, 
sort of first encounter the New Testament, first encounter Jesus through Jesus the Christ. It's part of the missionary library. You know, we're, we're, we're impressionable 19-year-olds. Uh, at least in my day, we were 19. They're younger even now. But, you know, so, so, so we encounter that and sort of internalizes it. And so the reason to unpack it then, one, is to show we need to be very, very careful using rabbinic literature. One of the big things I want to get away from, I, I want this, you know, the whole thing here to do, and in some ways my entire scholarly thing, is to recognize rabbinic Judaism is something for itself. It's not just a tool to be mined to make points about Christianity and New Testament. They, to this day, people read it, live it, you know, and certainly um, in, in, in those days, they lived it and they re- read it. And so we don't need to, so we need to be very careful for the historical reasons, for reasons of anti-Semitism, and also for reasons of recognizing that it's a literature in its own right and should not just be mined for our purposes to, and especially here, to be mined, to be used as an attack against Judaism itself. So the second point that you focus on is how the rabbinic notion of messengers and agency can help explain the New Testament idea of apostle. So unpack that for us here. Okay, so it's so this notion, so so kind of my, my, my examples are kind of just to sort of illustrate sort of different ways and different places where you can find useful things in the New Testament, that, that because rabbinic literature is such a, a deep well of literature, um, but also because it's so distant, that there is... Um, as you use it, it needs to be used, you know, th- there's different ways you can use it. There are different um, applications for it. This is one place where I think that we really do get a sense that maybe the underlying Jewish notion can help us understand um, something in the New Testament. So this notion of apostle, and of course the key meaning of the word apostle in Greek means, you know, the sent out one, the messenger, herald, right? You look up, um, you know, your earliest sources and it's like, you know, naval heraldry is kind of um, – a major sense of it. And so oftentimes, apostles understood in terms of missionary work, mm-hmm. which is great, um, even in our own tradition, right? Even the Doctrine and Covenant, right. it's a big deal that, you know, yep. part of what the apostles do is they go out and they go on missions, especially in the 19th century. But it doesn't explain places in the New Testament um, where apostles are not being sent out, where apostles seem to be Primarily based in Jerusalem. Primarily based in Jerusalem, yeah. exactly. We see this especially in Acts with Peter and John, where you know, um, the example I use is the example of um, where they go down to, you know, give the Holy Ghost to, um, to Philip there. They're in Jerusalem. They leave. They go to Samaria. They convert the Holy Ghost. And then they come back to Jerusalem. There doesn't seem any sense that they're doing any missionary work as part of that. And so it's really this question of it definitely has this meaning of, of sent one, you know, sent out one um, in Greek. That's sort of the etymological meaning. But that doesn't seem to be necessarily everything we see them doing within the New Testament itself. This is where kind of seeing sort of in rabbinic literature a similar notion, not that they're necessarily identical. Again, we have to be always be aware of both the temporal and the cultural divide between New Testament and rabbinic literature. But in Hebrew, you get this idea, uh, rabbinic Hebrew, of, of a shaliach. And a shaliach it means like um, apostle, it means sent one, right? It means somebody who 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 goes out, okay? Except that it, pr- its primary meaning is actually agent. So even though the, the etymological meaning is sent one, the primary meaning of shaliach is the one who does something on behalf of somebody else. So for example, um, a shaliach can deliver a, um, a divorce um, decree, what's called a get in Hebrew. And they go out and they, you know, they, they give it and there's a, whole, there's a whole law about if you decide to change your mind in the middle and whatever. Um, but the point is, is that the shaliach acts like you for the purpose of that. And this is where it gets – or I think the most intriguing example is the um, shaliach can be authorized to say prayers on behalf of the community. Okay, they can, um, and basically, one's a- if one agent says the prayers, it's as if you were saying the prayers um, yourself. And why that's key is there's no sense that they're sending a message there. They're just doing what you cannot do, what you cannot be there to do. And because the words, again, um, shaliach and the Greek equivalent are have the same etymological sense behind them, what I suggest here is that there's a possibility that this is one of the things that's going into the New Testament understanding of apostles. That there is a missionary sense of it, yes, but perhaps under the um, notion of rabbinic literature, this idea that 
they are then actually primarily understood as agents. Their it, job it, is to be Jesus's agents. So is this similar to like what we would call power of attorney in yeah, our day? Very much so. Um, very much so. And that when Jesus sends them out, again, even even sending them out, he's sending them out there, even in Matthew there, not primarily to preach his message, but to heal the sick, to, um, you know, find out, the, to, to do the things that Jesus would do if he could be there. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Study Center is a great place for you to check out. Since we are interviewing Avram Shannon in this episode, I want to alert you to a new book that has recently been edited by Dr. Shannon, along with BYU Religious Education's Gay Strathern, George Pierce, and Joshua Sears. The book is called Covenant of Compassion, Caring for the Marginalized and Disadvantaged in the Old Testament. This book is the collection of essays that were written for the 50th annual Sydney B. Sperry Symposium, which presentations you can watch online, by the way, at Religious Education's YouTube channel. This important theme of poverty and other humanitarian concerns is something that President Russell M. Nelson, the president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, has spoken about, declaring, quote, As members of the church, we feel a kinship to those who suffer in any way. We heed an Old Testament admonition, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy. End of quote. President Nelson's linking of Old Testament law with modern social concerns highlights the continued relevancy of the Old Testament for confronting modern challenges, including poverty, ethnocentrism, and the world's growing refugee crisis. The essays in this book speak to these themes and many more. Again, the book is called Covenant of Compassion, Caring for the Marginalized and Disadvantaged in the Old Testament. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. Okay, we've been listening to Avram Shannon discuss his publication on rabbinic literature and the New Testament. In part two of Our Religion, we like to get a little bit into why this matters for the everyday saint. What can this publication do to help inform and inspire us about loving and living aspects of the faith? Well, here's Brother Shannon exploring some of these questions, including some great points about allowing Judaism and other faiths to define itself on its own terms. So as we talk about Midrash, what would be a couple of things that, that you would emphasize that may actually strengthen the, the scripture study experience of a member of the church? So I think one of the most important things to talk about when thinking about Midrash is this notion that, and I think this is something that Joseph Smith illustrates so beautifully, this notion that scripture is dynamic, not static. That when we're reading the scriptures, when we're encountering, you know, fundamentally scripture study as religious devotion is about an encounter with divine, right? It's about us receiving revelation for our own lives right now, right? This is the great privilege of being a Latter-day Saint is receiving our own revelation and recognizing that instead of seeing scripture as simply an ancient text talking about ancient people, not that, not that that's not cool, not that that's not important. There's all kinds of cool stuff that you can think about in terms of its contextual whatever and backgrounds and things like that. But recognizing that if you approach text as something, scripture something dynamic, if you approach it as something where there is meaning there, continual meaning there, where you approach it as something where the meaning that the original author intended, while important, is, may, is not the only thing that God has to teach you. Um, it gives you, it opens up place for revelation, which I, again, Elder Holland has said, um, I think very um, beautifully, that the primary source of you know, knowledge and authority of Latter-day Saints is not scriptures. It's the living God. It's revelation from um, God himself. And so one of the things I think the Midrashic mode helps us think about is recognize that we can read Scripture, and we can read Scripture and look for the original context. That's important. That's valuable. That's necessary. Um, but you think about something like Nephi and likening, right? When, I, when I'm teaching, I'll often ask my um, students, you know, how is an apple like an apple? And they'll stop for a second, and they'll like, and then eventually, student will say, Brother Shannon, an apple is an apple. I said, precisely. When we're likening, 
we are definitionally acknowledging that things are different. The process of likening is not an interpretive process concerned with original contexts. It's, it's saying, okay, there's something there that's different. I can apply, I can liken that to my situation, what I'm doing. But again, if we're the same thing, we need to liken it. It would be the same thing. Apples are not like apples. Apples are apples. Apples are like oranges. Apples are like bananas. Apples are like trees. Apples are like any number of things. And it's that process of acknowledging both the differences and the similarities that really kind of gets this dynamic of, of reading scripture in a dynamic sense, not in a static sense. In your conclusion, you mention, as with the worked examples presented in this chapter, it's important to take rabbinic literature on its own terms. Rabbinic literature is not simply a source to mine for information about Jesus and the apostles, but a real and complete literature uh, or complex literature with its own rules and traditions. Even with that being said, it still represents one of the best sources for understanding how ancient Judaism thought on its own terms. Talk to us for a second about this idea of understanding them on their own terms. So number one, why is it so important for as we look at ancient Judaism? But number two, as we engage with other denominations in general, why is this such an important principle? Sure. And I think part of it comes is the first sense is, well, you know, how frustrated do we get when people don't engage with us on our own terms, right? When, you know, when they're unwilling to to talk to Latter-day Saints or about Latter-day Saints in ways that Latter-day Saints would even understand or or recognize. And so I think that, that, that part of it is it's just common courtesy in certain senses of being able to, to understand what they're doing and what like what we're doing within our own context, the claims that we're actually making for ourselves. Um, and part of that is if you use somebody as a term of understanding yourself, you're not going to understand them any better. You're only going to understand yourself better, which there may be value in that. Um, there, there, there almost certainly is value in that. But if you only look at, say, a Pentecostal denomination in terms of what that means to Latter-day Saints, you're never going to understand them um, for themselves. Same thing with you know our Catholic friends and especially with our Jewish friends. And it's especially important because, because Judaism is the matrix and because as Latter-day Saints, with our perspective on the House of Israel— we tend to sort of view Judaism in this, again, very positive, but almost paternalistic light, uh, you know, sort of our long lost cousin um, kind of thing. We're in some ways very likely to sort of treat them as Latter-day Saints without Jesus or something like that. And that's, that's not fair to them. It's not only really fair to us in terms of what we're understanding. But, and, so, and so it really is this notion of and part of this, I think, feeds into this, this tension we have. Again, Terrell de Givens talking about destructive tensions, right? We have a, t a tension in the work we have and just understanding and being good neighbors. And then we have the fact that we are an explicitly proselytizing religion. And, and so there's a little bit of tension there. And sometimes the one gets um, in the way of the other or whatever. And, you know, again, I, I think that for most of these things, living in those tensions is part of the great strength and um, beauty Absolutely. of being a Latter-day Saint. But it doesn't mean it's not tense in, um, in there. But it, it, I guess really the best thing I can say for this is, for you know, why it's so important is think about times when you felt heard as a person and as a Latter-day Saint. When somebody feels like who's not, you know, like or whatever, who, who, they, they, they take the time to understand where you're coming from. They take the time to get you. It feels great. And that's what we're trying to do with um, everybody, but especially we're trying to – it's what I'm trying to do with these ancient texts is let them – let just let them be themselves. We don't have to make them say something that, you know, they don't – they're not saying to make our point, right? Um, A.J. Levine, uh, she's a famous um, – she's actually a Jewish scholar of the New Testament. So she's kind of like me in reverse um, in some <laughs> ways, um, although – much better what she does in some ways also uh, with that. But but she talks about, you know, you don't need to make Jesus, you don't need to make Judaism worse to make Jesus better. <laughs> Jesus is plenty good in his own right. You don't need to actually, you know, you don't need to run them down to make um, Jesus better. Let Jesus just be good, but also let Judaism be good. And I think sometimes in our attempt to, um, our, our well-meaning and good attempt 
to make Jesus the best, we'll sometimes fall into these places where we'll sort of run down Judaism, run down ancient Judaism, even accidentally modern Judaism in our attempts to, um, to show that Jesus is best. And again, Jesus is best in his own right. If you're interested in reading Professor Avram Shannon's publication on rabbinic literature in the New Testament, we've included a link to it along with another article that he wrote on rabbinic oral law on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. There, you can also read more about Professor Shannon, as well as access links to articles from past episodes. And as usual, I want to encourage you to make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get automatic downloads of the latest episodes, and to share the podcast with others, and leave us a rating on your podcast platform. Those ratings really help, and we greatly appreciate them. All right, we've arrived at our final segment of Why Religion, where we like to talk a little bit more personally about the professor's academic journey and faith. So we conclude here with Professor Shannon telling us a little bit about his training, his journey to BYU, and his faith. Walk us through your academic training. You started here at BYU, so just kind of take us up through your time at Ohio State. Sure. So I started here at BYU— um, I st- actually started as, as, as an archaeology major because they didn't have the engineering and studies major at that time. And so I, I knew I wanted to do something with antiquity, but I, you know, I was in archaeology, did, did a lot of anthropology classes, but part of it is archaeology is super important. But for me, I love texts. I love being able to read and understand and work through um, ancient texts. And so when they created the ancient studies – Ancient Near Eastern Studies major here at BYU. I just, I mean, I I, I basically switched the day I learned about it. Um, I, I went to the, the um, yeah, just switched my major basically um, immediately and started doing texts. I had done some language. The very first class I took at BYU, just because of whatever, was a modern Hebrew class. Um, it just worked out because of um, how I um, how my schedule worked out, and so I had already working through Hebrew a little bit, but. I, I did that, I did the Hebrew Bible track, so I did Hebrew, I did um, lots of Hebrew there. I graduated in 2007 um, with Ancient Near Studies, Hebrew Bible, although I did study, I studied other languages too, um, I used to joke. So my brother, he also um, is a college professor, he teaches um, uh, marriage and family therapy at University of Louisiana uh, Monroe. So it's not like, you know, but I, I always tease him, I'm like, you know, Samuel, the more languages you know, the faster you get into heaven. <laughs> Um, he's like, whatever, Avram. But, um, you know, I, 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 so I was, you know, I studied languages. I did a little bit of Egyptian and things like that just to keep, um, because they're fun mostly. But uh, as far as this general understanding. And then I, um, I did my master's degree at Oxford um, in, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and that was, a, that was a degree in Jewish studies. Um, some of my colleagues um, in English education have also done the same degree. Matt Gray did it. And, um and some others of us. Um, and it was it was a really good experience, partially because, just in terms of linguistic abilities, one of the nice things, nice for certain values of the word, one of the different things about Hebrew instruction at Oxford, as opposed to almost every American university, is they require you to compose in biblical Hebrew. Mm. I.e., it's not just Hebrew to English, it's not just translation, but it's also English to Hebrew. Um, and so that was really, really useful. Also there at um, in that program, I did a lot with because of the nature because because of the Jewish studies program. Although my language is still Hebrew, I was still tend to do Hebrew. I wrote my master's thesis on the subversion of kingship in First Samuel. Um, I talk about how even though um, kingship is is sort of you know I mean scribes work for kings. You don't say bad things about your boss um, basically, <laughs> but you can still write subversive things. And there's some real um, subversive notions of oh, um, kingship there in First Samuel. Um, so even though I was still I was still very much biblically focused, almost all of my coursework was on the post biblical period. Almost all of it was. I mean, Martin Goodman's there, and he's you know this great guy in Judaism in Rome and things like that. Um, I had a class with Fergus Miller, one of the great. I mean, he's a classicist who got involved with Judaism just because it's an interesting. Te- you know, so I, I, there was a lot of work I did there on interpretation history and especially on Judaism within its broader. Um, Greco-Roman world. And so, so again, I was still Bible. This is totally Bible. My, all my languages were Bible there at, um, at Oxford. But a lot of my coursework was, was, was not. 
And so then I went to the Ohio State University. Again, I was intending to do um, Bible. I was intending to still do biblical Hebrew. I I had uh, history of the Hebrew language classes. I had, you know, I was going to do something with the Psalms maybe. I had this sort of vague idea of something with divine names in the Psalms kicking around um, in there for my for my, my dissertation work. But again, as I said at the beginning, a lot of the coursework there was because it was a new PhD program. I, 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 was, I was one of the first in the, I was in the first graduating class um, to um, get the a &E major here at BYU. I was the first um, Hebrew PhD um, graduated by the Ohio State University. So uh, in my department. So I was a, a pioneer in ways that I didn't always enjoy. Well, <laughs> we will say for that. But so part of it was 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 trying to get um, classes. So I, I I started off there. My advisor at Ohio State um, originally, well, he was a biblicist. He does great work with prophets. Um, you know, some really really um, powerful, he's a powerful linguist. All kinds of great stuff. Um, Sam Meyer. But. And I had great classes with him, but I, would have, I started having classes with Michael Swartz, who was also, um, and he, he actually does Jewish magic, which is um, tremendous for him. <laughs> Mostly heckalot mysticism um, there. But, but, you know, but in terms of sort of how I got to rabbinics, this is, I don't think I've ever um, told this really to anybody. Um, I mean, but I was sitting in general conference and I got a very distinct revelation that I needed to change advisors to change from um, Sam Meyer to to Michael Swartz. And I, I went home and told my wife, and my wife said, but you like Sam, <laughs> or Dr. Meyer. Um, and I said, I, I know. And she's like, but, but I did it. Even then, I kind of in my head, because part of it is, is that um, – Michael Swartz does a lot more in terms of theoretical, a lot more in terms of how it fits. You know, it, it, it's it's there's still strong philology, there's still strong linguistic uh, background there, but it's not, you know, competitive Semitic in that sense, um, in the same way. But I changed, but again, like I said, even though I was still putting maybe a Bible talk that kind of some more of the, that more approach, but that's kind of really sort of the conversation with um, about that sort of moved me um, towards rabbinics. And toward, but part of it is again building off of my experiences um, at Oxford. What I ended up writing on was really how Judaism is embedded in the Greco-Roman world, and so it was as much a question of, of what are they doing um, with that. And again, it's this. It's I think it's um, very significant in terms of even for Latter-day Saints, because part of what you find in rabbinic literature is they're always asking this question of how do you live Scripture in a world that's different, um, and of course. Halakha and Midrash and these things are their approach to that. In the same way that Revelation and you know our approach to the same questions, right? How 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 do you live the Book of Mormon in a world where it's very different from um, what the Nephites were doing in terms of of lots of things, I guess. And so and so really that again, I changed specifically because of that, but it sort of pushed me. So it, it wasn't even a sort of conscious. Now I like this better or whatever that uh, moved me into rabbinics. Probably, I think, the most telling day, though, between sort of moving from the biblical period to this is um, perhaps. Um, so one of the semesters, sort of one of the last semesters of my coursework at Ohio State, um, they, um, Dr. Meyer was offering a class at Ugaritic, which is a very important language for biblical studies. And Dr. Swartz was offering a class on Jewish magic. And they were at the exact same time. <laughs> So basically, it felt to me like I had to choose between, you know, sort of Bible, um, and I, I picked Jewish magic. Um, <laughs> that's the class I ended up taking. But that was kind of a sort of a watershed moment, at least in my own head. I don't think anybody else would have noticed, right? But in my own head, that was kind of the watershed moment that said, okay, Bible still matters. I was still interpretation history. I still um, whatever. But in terms of my temporal focus, it's going to be much more in, in the post-biblical period um, for that. And again, so that's why, again, I wrote my dissertation on, on – uh, Specifically on how the ancient, the earliest rabbinic Jews talk about and understand idolatry and non, what we would call idolatry. Um, so non-Jewish ritual. Hmm. Um, and they're actually suggesting my dissertation that all, idolatry is not actually that useful of a term. But that's part of uh, what I do with that. And and I happen to know from our road trip together that uh, when you were a little boy, you decided you wanted to be a college professor one day. I did. I was eight years old. Somebody, um, I, 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 the first day I learned what a PhD was, I said that. 
I want one of those. And now here you are. It's true. I am I lucky every day. <laughs> so so what uh how did you end up at BYU specifically in the College of Religious Education? Sure. So part of it is is it's this notion of so I I finished my um, PhD in 2015. I defended my dissertation and graduated in 2015. And there was a little bit of a gap period, um, just in general, right? You know, you graduate in spring, whatever, for the job market. Um, and so I actually came out here to to adjunct. Actually, I came out initially to um, help um, Jack Welch with a... Um, a, a project he was um, working on and then I um, and then I, I, I started adjuncting for early education and they started me off with uh, with Book of Mormon classes I began to really appreciate um, some of the advantages you have in teaching in early education the fact that we can you know there are advantages teaching outside of education too right there, there, there are advantages everywhere you teach um, teaching is the best part just everything um, I just I just I love to teach um, but with that, the ability at BYU to talk both about, again, about context, both about what, what Scripture says, where it's coming from, what they mean. What I, well, I often will talk about this as sort of the, the looking for the questions behind the answers in Scripture. What are, what are they asking? What are they concerned with? What are, what are their worries? What are their, what are their um, issues? And there's a real, um, again, but also to be able to then say to the students, Okay, so what does this mean? What do you do with this? And how do you, you know, how, how do you stop, you know, how, how, how can this um, really, you know, help you? So yeah, we can talk about, about Jesus and talk about, you know, his Jewish context. That's really important. I have a whole lecture on Jesus and the law and Jesus and halakha that I talk about in my New Testament classes where we just, we go through and talk about the Sabbath controversies and say that, you know, Jesus is right within, um, you know, his Pharisaic neighbors, right? You know, if, if, if somebody, if the ancient world, a Roman, for example, were to look at Jesus and the Pharisees he was arguing with, there would not be a whole lot of difference there from their perspective. But then be able to say, but of course, we're Christians here. So... We believe that Jesus is God, right? We believe he's the son of God, that he's, you know, he's divine. What does that mean for us too? And so really, I think um, that I mean, that's the great advantage in religious education. And so, um, so again, I adjuncted. I taught, I ended up teaching some pro great price classes, which is my, I mean, that, that's my bread and butter. I just adore um, teaching the pro great price. Um, it's so much fun. But, but then um, – because I talked to some of the faculty, I didn't think there were going to be job openings for right, but then suddenly, I don't. Again, I'm, I, I was not privy to those conversations, <laughs> but um, some jobs came open earlier than I expected, and I applied and I, I was hired, and now I've been here. I think this is four or five years. I've now been. Um, I've hired in 2017, so it's four years. Um, well, B BYU is lucky to have you, my friend. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I would love to end with with one question. One of the things that I admire most about you, uh, in addition to I just like listening to you talk, uh, it <laughs> entertains you. me. Um, but one of the things I admire most is obviously you're bright, but you also are are so supremely faithful to the restored gospel. And so I, I would love to maybe just end giving you an opportunity to share what what is it that grounds you in your faith? Well, I mean, the, the the short answer is Jesus, right? I mean, uh, fundamentally, it's I I'm really struck by as I work through it, you know, in in in, in First John, right? You know, we love because He first loved us, um, and I love um, in in, in C.S. Lewis's um, Chronicles of Narnia. Um, there's a bit where. Again, if you're not in the further narrative, it doesn't matter. But there's a bit where one character's talking to the other, and he encounters the Jesus figure in those books, Aslan, um, the great lion. And one of the characters who first discovered um, Jesus says, oh, you, 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 know, you know him. And the other character who's had more experience and, um, says, well, well, he knows me. And I really feel that. Is this, this notion that, that I, again, I don't know that I know him, but I know that he knows me. And for me, that's useful because it's been, in my own life, probably the hardest year of my entire life. No questions about it. 
And there's, again, recognizing that through that hardship, recognizing through that hardship that there's a way for, I mean, I just, I love that the Lord loves me and I love how he teaches me to love other people. That fundamentally the gospel of Jesus Christ is relational. It's about his relationship with me, mine with him, but also because of that, about my relationship with other people. And for me, I, I, again, you know, we just talked about the name of the church, right? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I love the fact that that's the actual full name. We get from the Book of Mormon the importance of the Church of Jesus Christ. And again, it's meaningless to me without Jesus. But I also love that back half there of Latter-day Saints. There is no church without you and I, with everybody else. And so for me, that gives me dedication, not just to Jesus as my personal savior. That, again, is so important to me. But it also gives me dedication to all of Jesus's, um, you know, children and all and the church as a, as a thing and the, church, and, and the saints, those of us who have been sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it, it, it just it just grounds me in the sense that it keeps me going because I can say, well, I'm doing my best and the Lord keeps working with me. I can presume the others are doing their best and let's all do this together and let's build Zion. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, hey guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.